um, a lot of agreement. Um, I think uh, you know uh, there's a lot of consensus on this panel that we, you know, India shouldn't go back to pre-1991 policies. Um, <laughs> Uh, China shouldn't go back to the Cultural Revolution. Um, and I think implicit in what Brad said is that we don't want to punish policymakers who screw up by uh, sending them to the guillotine. Um, beyond that, we had a uh, rather a lot of uh, uh, differences about uh, some pretty fundamental questions about how much to credit market forces, uh, particularly in China, uh, as opposed to restraints on market forces. Um, and on uh, how fast uh, China needs to uh, rebalance and uh, internationalize. I mean, I think there's a general agreement that it needs to, wants to ought to be moving in, 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 in the direction, but obviously a lot of difference about uh, the speed. Um, given the, the uh, lateness of the time, uh, and uh, I dare say the uh, hunger and uh, uh, hunger pangs that may be uh, materializing in the audience, um, I'm ready to throw it open to questions uh, if, uh, if people want to have any uh, comments that they want to make or, but please, it's, I think it's much better if you do put it in the form of a question and, uh, and keep them relative, okay, right in the front here. Thank you. Uh, given the fact that uh, most of the world's savings are now in Asia, and in terms of the flows of investment needs in particular over the next decades, are also going to be in Asia, uh, and the fact that the Asians are smartening up to the fact that having the cross-border links intermediating their savings back into the region internationally is not the smartest of things to do, uh, I mean, is it not true that a lot of the discussions we have been having around the global regulatory reform, et cetera, are, are a little bit uh, less relevant and, and a little bit redundant given the, if, if the predictions around China's and India's rise uh, happen to be even half true, uh, given how much of the financial and economic activity is going to be shifting to that part, and if most of that is intermediated domestically, what actually does, what policy implications does it have for a lot of the discussion on the global issues? Uh, we can, shall we pick up a couple of them? All right. Uh, sorry, I see a, it's awfully hard to see here, but right, yes, gentleman in the second row. Third row. <coughs> um, Peter Young. Um, I have a question to um, uh, Professor Yashan uh, Huan. I was very pleased to le uh, learn from you uh, about your remarks about the uh, entrepreneurial spirit, and particularly in the rural areas, and that was a very interesting notion, uh, uh, saying uh, some of the background of this on, on the, the backdrop of which that had developed. Um, uh, my question is, um, uh, would you see that there is a um, um, not for entrepreneurial uh, spirit and readiness of people to continue to start up the, uh, new firms in the pace we have seen that, and in particular also in, uh, with a view to serving uh, the, the, more the Chinese market than uh, exports, uh, so that uh, with the thrust of the new firms, uh, we see uh, a change in the strategy without each one of them having a, stra a grand strategy, but that their strategy is much more um, focused on the uh, local or the Chinese uh, market than on continuing an export-led uh, strategy. Okay, we can take maybe one more and then, okay. Um, just, just to follow up on that, uh, while uh, it's only in the third, third of the last uh, uh, 20 years that the Chinese currency became very substantially undervalued. Uh, it brought tremendous benefits uh, to China, um, not only in uh, protecting China from the financial crisis by being isolated, but by also by uh, in fact, uh, um, 
harvesting a large portion of the uh, surplus value of Chinese labor uh, and putting it at the disposal of the central government. So it was a f form of transferring purchasing power, wealth, from the citizens uh, to the government without imposing the uh, taxation. So it was a, an, uh, an, an involuntary transfer without the negative eff effects of the, uh, translation, uh, of taxation. And this brought, uh, uh, made the central government very powerful, uh, attracted the best talents and held the best talents in the, in, the, in the government or associated with the government because it was also a way of becoming um, uh, wealthy. So you had a system, what you might call state capitalism, but you can also call it crony capitalism because the state is in, in effect a crony state. Uh, uh, and that is such a, a benefit for those in power that when the time comes uh, to move um, and relax, uh, they, there's great resistance to it. And in fact, when it would have been very advantageous to, um, uh, to allow the currency to appreciate as a way of controlling inflation, the authorities missed uh, that opportunity uh, and resisted it. And you now have uh, inflation uh, somewhat out of control and uh, making, causing some serious danger of uh, wage price uh, uh, inflation. Uh, so while the positive development would be for uh, gradual relaxation because this cannot continue indefinitely. Uh, uh, the, there is great resistance somewhere in the government uh, mechanis uh, uh, mechanism to relax the system which serves the, uh, the interest of those in power uh, very well. And that, I find that uh, the critical question for the future in, of, of China. That's a, I don't know if that's the kind of uh, crony capitalism that uh, you were referring to, Professor Wan. You obviously had a somewhat broader uh, 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 picture in mind, but obviously that's, that, that question, I think, is one that you would, would, would want to answer. I, and I think maybe the first one, uh, Charles and Joe, uh, if, if you want to tackle. But uh, I think, Professor Wang, you had a couple, and then if, if, uh, if Mr. Yu, if you want to jump in on, on, on either of those uh, last two. Should I go first? Yes, please. Uh, I, I, I mean, that's a very interesting hypothesis, linking uh, currency value with crony capitalism. I, my, so if you look at the rest of East Asia in the 60s and 70s, they also had a, uh, a controlled exchange rate to benefit the exporters. And you know we can revise the thinking now, but at least the thinking is that that has a very wide distribution of the benefits for the poor people rather than for the bureaucrats, right? Because you need to draw the peasants who are low skilled into the manufacturing force and the comparative advantage of those economies was the production of export-oriented products. So I think there are two sort of um, uh, effects with this, and I would argue that given the distortions that Chinese system has, the, the, the currency value actually has some of these broad uh, positive effects. If you look at the rural, uh, if you look at the uh, export sector in Guangdong province, uh, they are drawing uh, rural migrant workers from the countryside uh, into the manufacturing industries. The issue, I think, is whether or not you do it at, at such a level and uh, you do it for su such a long period of time. It's not, I mean, that 
policy has proven to be effective in other East Asian economies. So that's one, the duration of the policy. The second, second what worked for East Asian economies with Taiwan and, and, and South Korea, it doesn't mean that China has to repeat that. China has one advantage that these two other economies didn't have. China has a potential huge domestic market. So it is a little bit puzzling why, as a policymaker, you systematically favor foreign markets at the expense of the domestic market development. One of the critical issues about the, devalu uh, the, the, the undervalued exchange rate, I actually don't see that as a purpose of the strategy. It is really the effect of an investment-driven strategy that doesn't provide a lot of em employment opportunities, that investments are controlled by the state sector, and the state has been very effective, until very recently, holding down the wage growth. Right? So essentially, when you hold down the wage growth, in a country like China, the, the, the rural income growth has been very modest in the 1990s until very, very recently. It, the, the consumption to GDP ratio declined not because of the high saving, private savings rate. <laughs> One of the biggest misconceptions about, about that is in, in, uh, many Western economists believe that. They think it is because the Chinese don't have the social security system, don't have social safety net. I'm not sure that India has a very well developed social safety net, and yet in that country, consumption to GDP ratio is 50, you know, 55%, whereas with China, it's 35%. The problem there is that because the service sector in China is systematically suppressed, and service sector is most labor intensive, you actually need to subsidize Americans in order to create demand for export-oriented products that are labor intensive, right? So I actually see that as the causal linkage. It's really the concern about employment under the condition that you have other policies that systematically suppress employment, especially in the service sector. It is really in that context that uh, undervalued exchange rate seems to make sense from a social point of view. My argument is that uh, that's not going to be long lasting. And then you should do lots of other things to promote service sector development, which is, you know, China has a service sector uh, relative to GDP lower than Saudi Arabia. Right? It is just, it's just, it's just uh, for a country like that, there's, that's, there's a plenty of space to grow, to develop and generate employment and income opportunities. The problem with China is that they are, they are using the right hand to subsidize the Americans, and they use the left hand to, to, to suppress the income development of the Chinese, right? You ought to see some sort of readjustment of those two different policy positions. Okay, we're gonna uh, try to wrap up fairly soon. Uh, Mr. Yu, can you just give a quick comment, uh, if, you, if you have any, uh, anything to add to uh, what Professor Huang said, and then we'll, we'll answer okay. the first question, but we're, uh, we're, we're running This late. is a very long story, so I cannot explain this <laughs> in minutes. But uh, I think there's one point that's very important. Chinese come fear employment because of uh, RMB appreciation. Because in China, more than uh, 30 million workers are employed in the industry which are related, in, related to export. So this is a very important issue. Why we argue for RMB appreciation? Because, number one, we should not continue to pile up our cherry bills, which is uh, his value is uh, evaporating very quickly. <laughs> and so for long run, this is bad for China. So there's a trade-off, short-term pain and long-run losses. We must make a decision. Secondly, because there's inflation, so on the appreciation is helpful for containing inflation. But uh, in China, RMB exchange rate is not used as instrument to fight against inflation. Because in China, we have uh, enough monetary instruments to find against the inflation. Yeah, okay. Um, we're down to about a minute or so uh, left. And I know you're... Okay, let me very, very quickly yeah. just say, first come back to the point that Gordon Brown made yesterday uh, about a growth compact. Uh, in uh, linking this with what you said, if there were higher global growth, there'd be more comfort about uh, exchange rate appreciation because the risk of job loss would be much, uh, much lower. And so uh, while we've been arguing for exchange rate as a means for growth, it, 
if you thought of growth, it would be actually a facilitate exchange rate. On the first question, uh, I think the point that, that you know, Asia, China is already larger in savings than the United States, even though its economy is smaller, and that Asia more broadly is, a, uh, is going to be a large, uh, source, uh, larger source of savings, means that there will be a shift in uh, the locus of intermediation. I think that's, that's right. And uh, before you could argue that uh, Western banks did a better job of allocating capital, managing risk, but I think the crisis has thrown that hypothesis into, into question. So uh, it would make more sense for, for them to try to learn better how to manage risk and allocate capital and to do it in Asia rather than ship the goods back and uh, ship the money one direction and get it back again with exchange rate risk then being absorbed, uh, unfortunately, often on the backs of, uh, of, of Asia. Um, but the import of that is that if very large fractions of money are being intermediate, intermediated coming from China and intermediated by Chinese institutions, it's going to be the regulatory structures of China that will be very, very important and harmonization will have to be, you know, the presumption that more of the harmonization is going to be with the rest of the world to the regulatory structures that, that China decides. Um, and final point, one of the reasons for, at least some people believe, for the uh, lack of development of the service sector, and one of the reasons for the high savings rate is the lack of uh, adequate development of the financial institutions for SME lending. You know, the, the big banks are very good at lending to yeah. state-owned enterprises, but have not really developed the capacity as those, as Charles was saying, in, in the West. And so that uh, broadening and, and deepening the financial institutions to have, you know, more community banks and the kind of local uh, microcredit schemes and, and that are, are one of the ways, I think, that, that will simultaneously solve several of these problems uh, that China faces. Are we getting somewhat closer to convergence, Charles? I go, this could give you a very, if you could just very briefly. Uh, I think so, right? and I, okay. I, I think we should <laughs> wrap up. I'll only make yeah. two comments, really. I think the, the accumulation of savings in Asia increases the imperative of global coordination. And I would really hope that in the next phase of, of some of the iNetwork, this brilliant project that we're all engaged in, that more attention could be given to how the economic profession can help frame improvements in the governance structures so that we're not talking about the Chinese exchange rate or Brazilian exchange control or the U.S. fiscal deficit in isolation. Because I think that is the imperative that I see here today. I do believe that China is prepared increasingly to play by some global rules of the game if they think others will deliver and if they have an influence in shaping those rules of the game, which they really haven't so far. Thank you. Okay, well, uh Please join me in thanking this panel. Um,